B. Or not to be. That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against deceived troubles by opposing and them to die to sleep to sleep perchance to dream <laughs> I there's the rub for in that sleep of death what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time but that the dread of something after death, that undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others we know not of. <laughs> Thus, conscience does make cowards of us all. And the native hue of resolution is sicklied o'er with the pale cast of thought and enterprises of great pith and moment. With this regard, their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Now, for those of you who don't recognize that, that is an excerpt from one of the most famous works in all of the English language. It is from Act Three, Scene One of William Shakespeare's Hamlet. Now, if I were to summarize the play in a sentence for you, I would say it's about a boy tasked with a man's problems. You see, before the play starts, Hamlet's father dies, and he's really sad about this. And soon his uncle marries his mother. After the play starts, he's on the ramparts of the castle one night, and he sees the ghost of his father, who tells him that his death was no mere coincidence, and that his uncle was the perpetrator of his father's murder. Thus sets up Hamlet with an inner conflict of trying to find revenge and trying to find out who he is. Thus sets up this speech. From a literal standpoint, the to be or not to spe uh, be speech is quite simple. Hamlet is contemplating suicide. He's wondering whether he should be or not be. But the reason why it's so famous is not because of its literal simplicity, but because of the complexity of its subtext. Let me explain a little bit. Hamlet here is not just questioning whether he should be or not be physically, but whether he should be the man to avenge his father and kill his uncle or to not be, whether he should be the complacent boy he's been told he has to be or to not be, whether to be the person to reprimand his mother for what she's done or to not be, and of course, whether he should be or not be at all. Hamlet's discourse here is so much more complex when you put all of these elements together and you see he's not just questioning his physical existence, he's questioning what it means to be Hamlet, what it means to be himself, what it means to be a human. And this is the struggle that he's faced with throughout the play, and the struggle that so many people today are faced with in the world, a crisis of identity. Hamlet doesn't know who he is anymore, and he's struggling to find that. Now, it's often said that challenges reveal who we truly are, and I would agree with that statement to an extent, because Challenges require us to use our experience and our knowledge and bring out the best part of ourselves to overcome them. However, when we don't have that experience or that confidence in ourself that we've gained through that experience, we're unable to surmount our challenges. We just can't accomplish them. And this is a problem I see so many people running into today. They are trying to accomplish something, but they can't. They just become lost. Now. My solution to this problem is immersing the self in what I call human expressions of creativity. Now let me digress a minute to explain what I mean by this. Humans are really interesting creatures. We are our ability to reason, to problem solve, and most importantly to communicate what we've learned with each other is quite unparalleled with 
any creature we know of. We simply have this special ability to share our experience with other people. And we're the only animals that will sit in a circle for hours and listen to each other talk and perform and tell a story or dance or sing or anything like that. And these are what I call human expressions of creativity. They're these forms of communication between people that relate personal experience. Now, the reason why these are so great is because they relate human experiences. They're often stories about characters, about people, or about characters that are like people that encounter human challenges, and through human experiences, they overcome them. And by immersing ourselves in these, we adopt the experience of the characters and the knowledge of them, and we incorporate it into our own lives. There's a reason why texts like the Bible, Homer, Shakespeare, uh, Faulkner, Fitzgerald, just to name a few, have lived on. And that's because they're stories about people going through problems people encounter every day. And then they use their own experience, which the reader or the listener or what have you adopts for themselves and can use it in their own life. Now, I can't provide you with any scientific evidence or quantitative results of, I promise you this will work, but I can try to explain how human expressions of creativity have shaped my own life, specifically reading, writing, and acting. And I'd like to share a little bit in my own experience in these three fields with you now. Firstly, reading, if we go in order. My mother started reading to me as far as I can remember. I know The Good Night Moon and The Little Engine That Could were some of my favorite books as a little, little kid before I could read. And by the time I turned six, my mom had progressed to reading actual novels to me. And as you can probably guess from the title on the screen, the first novel that I ever had read to me was Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. By the time we had gotten onto the third book, I was already reading them by myself, and I can remember waiting in line at midnight for the fifth, sixth, and seventh book especially, and being so sad to know that they were finally over. But the reason why is because these books, especially the first, my first experience with them, had really changed my life, and it taught me something about myself. By adventuring with Harry, Ron, and Hermione throughout their years at Hogwarts, I learned the principle of courage. I became a more courageous per person. Whether they were fighting a basilisk or dementors or death eaters or Voldemort himself, I began to feel their courage in myself and their bravery and I took it on. For example, three and a half years ago, my family and I took a trip to South America and we went to Peru and we went to Machu Picchu. And for those of you who don't know, Machu Picchu is a city built by the Incas in the mountains, in the Andes Mountains. And the city is on a really steep mountain itself. So it's a long drive up there, almost straight up. And when you get to the city, there's just clouds and tall faces of rock everywhere you can see. And so we got there, and we decided we wanted a picture of Machu Picchu. The problem was we can't take a picture of the city from the city, so we had to go to one of the lookouts. And our guide told us, okay, you can go to this lookout here overlooking the city, or you can go to the lookout overlooking the lookout overlooking the city. So, of course, we decided to take the longer hike up the tall uh, mountain to get to the lookout for the best picture. And I probably should have mentioned that I'm deathly afraid of heights. I don't like them at all. And as we were hiking up, I wasn't too scared. The path was close around the mountain. I didn't have to look over the steep edge and see the rocks. But when we got to the top, my heart dropped. I was standing there, and I started breathing heavily because what I saw before me was something that really scared me. It was a stretch of land, maybe eight feet across and three or four feet wide, not dissimilar to this box here, with a sheer drop of at least a thousand or so feet on either side, or at least that's what it looked like to my younger self and my heart started pounding. But it was not that far across, and I remembered, and I thought back to Harry, Ron, and Hermione, and I thought of how brave they had been, whether fighting off giant chess pieces or finding the Sorcerer's Stone. And I remembered Al Albus Dumbledore's quote, which really inspired me at the end of the first book. It takes a great deal of courage to stand up to our enemies, but an even greater deal to stand up to our friends. And so I stood up to my friend, myself, and I took a deep breath, and I walked across. 
and I got the picture, and I was so happy for it that I overcame this fear, this challenge that I had by simply not having to experience it, but having read about it and reading, reading about these characters. And this reading has shaped my life, and I'll move on to writing now. For those of you who don't go to Seabury or haven't had children who have gone to Seabury, the eighth graders go through a rite of passage known as the eighth grade project. And this starts out as a research paper. The students each research a topic and they write a paper on it. Then they create a physical project, which is their physical component, and they, then they present their research and their project to a panel of peers and judges on which they're graded, et cetera, et cetera. My project was on fictional writing. And for my physical project, I decided to write a novel. By no means is it anything I would wish to share today because my eighth grade self is not quite the writer I am now, but it's an accomplishment for me, especially by what I learned from writing uh, my own book. And the characters I created, whose names were Desmond and Amanda, were tasked with the uh, Herculean task of stopping this company from using their time travel machine to manipulate and to take over the world. And what I really admired about them as I created their characters, as I wrote about them, was their resilience. Whether they were being shot out of helicopters or just plain shot, or fighting an army of robots, or something went wrong with the time machine, they always bounced back to it. And they were always able to come back from whatever setback they had encountered. And it inspired me. I don't know where it came from inside, but I just felt it pour out of me. And then I soon began to adopt resilience. As I moved into high school and I started involving myself in extracurricular activities and challenging courses and um, plays and sports, of course, those are extracurricular activities, I began to become overloaded. And especially when something went wrong, if I got a bad grade on a test or I had some bad news about anything, really, it was hard to bounce back because there was so much overwhelming work to be done. But by remembering and thinking back to Desmond's and Amanda's resilience to whatever task they encountered, I said, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna be that like myself. And from their experience, I used their experience and I made it mine. And I used their resilience and I made it mine. And I was able to overcome these challenges. So when I was faced with a bad test grade or a piece of bad news, I was able to bounce right back and get back into the swing of things. And thus, writing has also shaped my life. Finally, acting. Acting is something that I find enjoyable and that I find interesting because not as many other people do. In fact, a lot of people are definitely afraid to come up and perform in front of a big audience, but it's natural to me. I've loved doing it ever since I was a little kid. I love being in the spotlight. <laughs> so, pretty recently, I was involved in Shakespeare's... Um, Hamlet, here at Seabury, our modern rendition. No, I don't normally dress like this. This is a costume. And I was struggling with something as we put on the play. And it was interesting. I already gave you a brief summary of what happens in the beginning of the play, but basically Hamlet resolves to set up a test for his uncle to see if he's guilty, because he's not sure if the ghost was lying to him or if he was telling the truth. He sets up this test and he finds out that his uncle probably really did kill his father. But his uncle knows about the test and then decides that he has to kill Hamlet because he's afraid that Hamlet will kill him. So what he does is he sends Hamlet off to England in a ship to be executed. However, by some random act of chance, the ship is abducted by pirates and Hamlet escapes. And when he comes back from England, there's a huge transformation in Hamlet's character. Before, he is very logical. He likes to set things out and uh, make a plan to try to accomplish his goals, even though it never works out. But when he comes back, there's something different about him. He says, there's a divinity that shapes our ends. Rough hew them how we will. And this puzzled me. And as I was sitting back there on opening night with the yellow light of the backstage light down on my face and I was thinking about this transformation, I was really struggling with it. And then it dawned on me. I understood what Hamlet was going through. He found faith. And that's something that I have now adopted into my own life. It's pretty recent, so I don't have any concrete example that I can look back on and give you like from before. But I believe through Hamlet, I've become a more faithful person. I've learned to believe in that which you cannot see, with that what I cannot control. Like Hamlet, you have to wait for your opportunity. You can do what you can, 
but ultimately you have to wait for your opportunity and then take it when it comes. And thus, acting has shaped my life. Now, as I've said before, I can't prove any of this to you. I can't guarantee that if you go and you pick up a book or you go and you watch a movie that your life will be changed forever. But I know that if you're really inspired by a human expression of creativity, you'll learn something about yourself. And slowly but surely, you'll adopt it into your own life, and it'll influence your decisions in the future for the better. Remember that you have the power to do anything. It is in your very skin. The only hitch is, do you know yourself well enough to succeed? That is the question. Thank you.